tell us what, what you're doing today in uh, D.C.? They've had 11 hearings where they demonize me and lie about me and make up all this outrageous crap. I'm a Russian agent. I'm a racist. I did all this other stuff. So I came here to let them know. In America, when you have hearings about somebody or someone, you're supposed to have them there. So they call me the king of fake news because I'm effective and tell the truth. They're a pack of liars. The, the Democrats are openly calling for the end of the First Amendment, targeting conservatives, libertarians, Christians, nationalists, free marketers, renaissance folks. And so... I'm going to start coming to these hearings where they demonize me because I've requested to be at these hearings. I noticed they only attacked me a few times today because I was here. Usually it's constant. And then Marco Rubio threatened to uh, physically attack me for no reason. I mean, this is a political class running scared, a bunch of chicken neck political peacocks, a, a corrupt establishment, and thank God Trump's exposing the censorship. Things are changing as usual, but at the moment there's a concern that our First Amendment is in jeopardy and people are pissed. This country's coming back from the dead, political class knows it, and I'm honored to be ground zero of the first big band because it woke everybody up and the antitrust suits and everything else are coming. And these big tech companies are on notice. America's back. CNN, CNN and the Democrats, you know, are destroying the First Amendment and needs to be stood up against. Mr. Dorsey, when can I have my verification back? Obama set up a CIA office to shut down independent press in the US. I am a journalist. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Obama set up a CIA office before he left to shut down independent populist media in the U.S. And Trump knows it's getting ready to sign an executive order reversing it to the Defense Authorization Act. Watch. So that's the reality of what's going on. I told you it was a bait and switch. That's how media operates. Information wars, troll bots, informants, and whistleblowers. There's something wrong with the news today. And it appears as if all the world really is a stage. Politicians have spun the news for centuries, but it's different now. The internet forces us all to pay attention. These issues add us thinking. Maybe focusing on the mainstream and casting alternative media aside is like seeing the world through a small window. If a person has walls between them and potentially valuable information, how can they be sure they have any story straight? There's really no way for us to know what information is important until we've seen it all. Ignoring certain media outlets could limit your grasp on reality. If you don't believe us, just investigate the social divide that surfaced around the 2016 election. News outlets looked like they were conspiring against each other. We're not the only ones that saw it either. The, the, the White House communication staff has to believe they are now at a state of war. This is war. Attacking our network. I, I just want to ask you, sir. I'm changing it from fake news, though. D doesn't that undermine? Very fake news. I know, but aren't you? In 1948, the Smith-Munt Act was signed by Harry Truman. And if you listen to that noise right now, Anya, hear that rumble? That's Harry Truman rolling over in his grave. Our goal was simple. Act as citizen journalists and investigate what some are calling information warfare or fake news. In order to do that, we studied the slanted commentary around the most controversial stories we could find. And then to understand the motives, we knew we had to interview people with conflicting ideas. We were confident the Russian government, at the highest level, tried to affect the outcome of the U.S. election. If, if whenever things are going badly for you and you lose, you start blaming somebody else, then you don't have what it takes to be in this job. And they began to have some of their allies within the uh, Internet world, like Infowars. That's their plan. Put out a bunch of fake news, then come in and go, oh my God, look at all the fake news and then try to discredit the entire web. You have RT, you have Sputnik, you have Rupley, um, and then I, I think you have them feeding uh, other entities. Uh, Infowars comes to mind where those are echo chambers. When we started this documentary, we anticipated a simple process, but nothing was simple. And suddenly, we were tumbling down a rabbit hole into this wild, gonzo-style world where art and reality merge. As spectators to this ongoing battle for our minds, it was all too easy to get lost in time. Before we knew it, tremors from the next presidential election were beneath our feet, and we were still digesting all the hype stories from the last few years. I want to clarify, I'm not an actor. <laughs> I lie for a living. The reality is no one can hide what they do on the internet or in public anymore. For now, we're all forced to face our decisions. I don't think anyone's worried about the digital footprint they're leaving for future generations. We are now surrounded by digital products and services that are constantly recording everything we are doing. Which basically means that a large part of the big data that humanity is generating these days are the digital footprints, or let's call them behavioral residues, 
uh, that we are leaving uh, behind as we are interacting and using, uh, interacting with each other and using uh, the devices. In the beginning of our citizen journalist experiment, we were focused on finding the common ground in the chaos that this media epidemic created. Our curiosity only led us to one conclusion. Once you're deep in the rabbit hole, everything looks sensational. Google defines it as presenting information in a way that is intended to provoke public interest and excitement at the expense of accuracy. We're not trying to be sensational. It's hard not to be sensational in the environment that we're in, but that is not our goal. First, we're going to have to go back. We're going to have to go back really far to kind of grasp the entire concept of fake news and how it started and what humans use it for. We read about President Lincoln's use of the press to deride his political rival, James Shields, and the dual challenge that it led to. We even found news about Lincoln cracking down on the press with an executive order. Researching the end of the 1800s, we saw the term yellow journalism being used to characterize sensational stories. And yeah, that means fake news is old news. Trends continued into the 1900s, but we noticed the concept of propaganda became more of a science. And there were three men that stuck out as the founders. A man named George Creel, who was an investigative journalist that went to work with President Woodrow Wilson, hoping to prevent censorship of criticism with government outreach. Wilson appointed Creel as chairman of the Committee on Public Information, where the Four Minutemen were created. This group of significant figures volunteered to give four-minute speeches for the war effort under Woodrow Wilson's authority. Walter Lippmann, another advisor to Wilson, was a major critic of the press. He philosophized about journalists being biased and what it could do to public opinion. Then there was the famous Edward Bernays, nephew of Sigmund Freud, who left the Committee on Public Information and started a business around public relations. Insight from Bernays helped us comprehend how U.S. lawmakers are handling the way we exchange information. But I'm afraid this man could have never predicted how technology would change the game. Like the Allies harnessing the power of an atom to confront a superpower in World War II, the Internet has given the average person the ability to confront the highest levels of power today. Mindfulness, in essence, is a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. So what that just basically means is that mindfulness is the ability to notice what's happening in the moment, just as it is, objectively, without bias. Mindfulness is the ability to stay present and focused in this moment, which is the only reality we really have, not being dragged backward into thoughts of the past, regrets, things like that, not being dragged forward into the future, which hasn't even happened yet, but just staying anchored right here in the moment in the actual reality that we have. Let me give you a couple of introductory thoughts here, and this is critical for everybody, especially the kids out there. Remember what Tolstoy said, history would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. And the news would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. Everything that we hear is propaganda. Everything that we hear is a lie. Everything that we see is put through the, the, the framework, the, the matrix, the prism of that which somebody wants you to believe. After World War II, there were a lot of concerns about America's intentions. It was obvious that someone had to provide answers before the concerns escalated into more conflict. With the passing of the smith Mund Act, the U.S. was able to produce media materials for people overseas. A lot has changed since 1948, though, including the laws about information. To find out what the laws are today, you have to look through all the titles in the U.S. Code that have to deal with exchanging information. The laws are complicated, sometimes open to interpretation, and changing all the time. Part of the struggle is the time it takes to develop the whole picture. Civilians have always questioned what their government can and can't do, but they're not alone. This speech from President Eisenhower was interesting to us because... He was a military man that understood the importance of an open communication between a government and its people. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central it also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. 
Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans. So what I did was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. Digging through American history to find examples of propaganda, we saw stories about CIA projects that supposedly influenced the media, stories of globalist movements joining forces, and theories that connect a CIA official named Cord Meyer Jr. to all of it. It's easy to get lost in stories surrounding Mr. Meyer. Apparently, his ex-wife had an affair with JFK before he was assassinated, and she was killed a year later. The speculation around Mary's diary had us on a trail. This piece of evidence over to a member of the secret agency there was going to be a trial of a man for this murder and this was a piece of evidence essentially that he handed over to james angleton so tony gave the diary to james angleton yep um, i'm trying to get it as a statement from you yeah well i don't want to give it as a statement from me while cord was writing peace or anarchy the world feared atomic bombs being unleashed in the cold war today the world worries about disinformation stirring civil uprising in either case, the focus is on winning hearts and minds. Why? Because whoever has that usually settles the overall conflict. It seemed Cord knew this, and may have even used it in his work. Diving into conspiracy theories around Meyer may seem pointless, but it opened our eyes to similarities between his day and ours. Meyer was also tied to a group called the United World Federalists after the war. And some say that group is supposed to be linked to a modern group called the World Federalist Association, or Citizens for Global Solutions. His literary skills, combined with his impressive career as a high-ranking intelligence official, gave him great influence. His ideas sparked questions. Which is better to preserve the future of mankind? A world governed by one body, or a world of sovereign nations? If there was anybody in my generation that I can think of that uh, looked like a promising leader, it was Cord Meyer. He looked to me as if he was going to be the spokesman for my generation. All right, let's figure this out. Why is globalization a topic of Cord's day and ours? Why do people fear organizations that strive to govern on a global basis? Well, Cord's activities in the 50s were pretty mysterious, kind of like the activities of the people in his position today. I don't know. Perhaps it has something to do with the claims that these globalists infiltrate and use activist groups to change public opinion. First, we Americans are going to have to yield up some of our sovereignty. That's going to be, to many, a bitter pill. It would take a lot of courage, a lot of faith, a lot of persuasion to them to come along with us on this necessity. For more than a generation in America, it wasn't the news until Walter Cronkite told us it was the news. And people have rejected this foreign, nebulous, corporate rule of things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So what are they going to do as people nationalistically wake up from Brazil to Spain to the United States, from leftist movements and right-wing movements, you name it, saying we want to be ruled by ourselves locally. We want to dictate our own destiny. There's questions to be asked about anyone's intentions, especially when they have power. What would drive important figures to push any group's agenda? Doctor, what, uh, tell me again what the doctor is. What are we dealing with well, here? You're the father of uh, public relations. What we're dealing with really is the concept that people will believe me more if you call me doctor. Oh, I see. <laughs> public relations embraces what I call the engineering of consent based 
on Thomas Jefferson's principle that in a democratic society, everything depends on the consent of the people. So, you know, psychology and the news are, are married, right? What we receive, you know, we take into our psyche and react accordingly. And then there's this thing called groupthink, right? So it's like wildfire, right? One spark in a lot of dry area starts this fire. And that's what happens in particular with social media and how we share. So we receive this news, we have an emotional reaction and we hit the share button. And then the next person who's a trusted you know, accomplice, friend, whatever it is, sees what we're sharing and they're like, oh my God, they shared it, they hit share. That's how it spreads like wildfire. And this groupthink idea comes in where, you know, then we all start thinking that what's being shared is the truth. It was back in the 1980s when I was very actively involved doing mergers and takeover work and publicly uh, covered big transactions that got a lot of news media. And I would be in the boardrooms and meeting with the top CEOs of these uh, transactions and what was reported in the newspaper as inside uh, dope on what was really going on with these transactions was 100% wrong day after day after day I was in the room the next day I look at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times business section and they'd be discussing a transaction that bore no resemblance to what I knew was actually going on it's possible to be propagandized um, and indoctrinated into um, a kind of nationalistic and American exceptionalist narrative at a very young age, um, as soon as you start learning English. Yuri Bezmenov was a KGB agent that defected to the West during the Cold War. He informed the world that most of Soviet military efforts were focused on subversion. While speaking with Max, we thought about how subversion methods could be surfacing in America today. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. So throughout my childhood, I was being exposed to propaganda. I grew up during the Cold War. Um, I, you know, began to develop some critical detachment, for example, when I saw an advertisement about Ronald Reagan's so-called peace shield, which is when he wanted to um, ramp up Pentagon spending and have a space gun that would shoot down Soviet missiles. This was part of the neoconservative push for a defense buildup, and he had this cartoon commercial that would come on, and I was just a kid, but it was such obvious propaganda to me. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called Basically, demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. It is somewhat of a catch-22 for me to admit that we're a demoralized nation. Um, given that I have studied positive psychology, I'm a positive psychology practitioner, and I work a lot with mindfulness, inherently I have an optimistic view to the world and the direction in which we're going. But of course, that's predicated upon the fact that we're all on board with practicing the tenets of mindfulness and positive psychology in the first place. After the Cold War, I think propaganda really uh, began to refine itself. Um, the idea of this kind of new world order that um, George H.W. Bush was pushing. This is not, as Saddam Hussein would have it, the United States against Iraq. It is Iraq against the world. As an adolescent, I thought, you know, that sounds pretty good. I, I didn't question the narrative of the first Gulf War. Um, that was the first time I was exposed to 24-7 news. On CNN, you would see footage of smart bombs. It's like, what are the smart bombs? I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq on this particular day. Keep your eye on the crosshairs. Right there. Look at here. Right through the crosshairs. And now in his rearview mirror. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that um, the narrative we were hearing about babies being torn off their incubators by invading Iraqi troops into Kuwait was fake news. It was actually um, the witness who had supposedly seen this was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. 
our final witness is also using an assumed name and again we ask uh, our friends in the media to respect the need to for her to protect her family and we finally call on Naira to testify Mr. Chairman and members of the committee my name is Naira and I just came out of Kuwait my mother and I were in Kuwait on August 2nd for a peaceful summer holiday my older sister had a baby on July 29th and we wanted to spend some time in Kuwait with her I only pray that none of my 10th grade classmates had a summer vacation like I did I may have wished sometimes that I could be an adult that I could grow up quickly what I saw happen to the children of Kuwait and to my country has changed my life forever it has changed the life of all Kuwaitis, young and old. We are children no more. And the Kuwaiti ambassador had paid hundreds of millions of dollars to 40 public relations firms in Washington to spin out this story. Hill and Knowlton, the PR firm, and the Rendon Group uh, managed to get every mainstream network to tell this horrible story of babies being ripped off their incubators. Then George H.W. Bush delivers the story. Uh, to the American public and we fell for it and I remember being excited about this war um, and thinking that no civilians were being killed because we had smart bombs. The test we face is great and so are the states. This is the first assault on the new world that we see. The first test of our metal. Had we not responded to this first provocation with clarity of purpose, if we do not continue to demonstrate our determination, it would be a signal to actual and potential despots around the world. America and the world must defend common vital interests, and we will. For most of the American forces involved in the combat of the last 24 hours, this was their first experience facing live fire. And for most of us, it's very hard to know what they were going through. So tonight, NBC News has asked a group of men who do know what that's like, Vietnam veterans, what was it like when they faced combat for the first time? My name is Ted Patton. I was a draftee. I was uh, with the 12th of AC, attached to the 25th Infantry in Coochie, Vietnam. <clears throat> it's a dirty way to die. It really took getting out of the 90s and having George W. Bush being elected president uh, for me to start understanding um, the role of propaganda in pushing war, um, in protecting the oligarchy, um, and I had to start a process of looking back throughout my whole life and understanding how I'd been propagandized. The Saudi dissident who you referred to, Hassami bin Laden, he is, uh, his father had 52 children from a number of different wives. He is uh, worth uh, several hundred million dollars according to Robin Wright who wrote the piece for the LA Times and he profiles, she profiles how he turned against the Americans essentially as a result of Operation Desert Storm in 1990. Well you know there was a there was a very interesting book written a couple of years ago by a journalist named Jonathan Quitney that was called Endless Enemies and his theory was that um, the United States foreign policy simply creates uh, enemies wherever we go and, and I think this is another example. When, when we intervene in the, in the affairs of other countries and we shoot at people and people get shot at with American bullets and American weapons, we create enemies. And if this, if this is true, that this man uh, turned against the United States government as a result of Desert Storm, we've created another enemy there we might not have had before. You, you try to not get personal when you talk about all of this. You want to really try to be objective, but it's hard to talk about this without talking about my own personal background. Um, I'm from a very small town in Ohio, and my political development began in the Bush years. Um, I, you know, we talked about politics in my household. It was, you know, we were Democrats. Most people in my little town were Republicans, but it wasn't that big of a deal until 9-11, until I was kind of thrust into politics. I didn't really have a choice in the matter. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a difficult moment for America. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. 
I remember at my school we had to become a living flag. Uh, I, we were all assigned a color and on the, uh, on the lawn of the school we dressed in different colors and we became a, a living flag and they took pictures of it and sold it around, uh, around the town. It was kind of a, a corny thing that they did. Um, and it was just, I was constantly being, being pushed into doing things that were deeply political. Once we had a better understanding of propaganda and how it's used, we started breaking down how the internet is shaping a generation right in front of us. Millennials have been exposed to more propaganda from more cultures around the world than any generation before them. What does that mean for society? After 9-11 happened, we were being told that, uh, well, we were attacked by Muslims who hate our freedom. And that just didn't seem right to me. Uh, it seemed like there was something more to the story. And I suddenly was asking questions about what was going on. And then, of course, there was the call to invade Iraq. Secretary of State Powell will present information and intelligence about Iraqi's legal, Iraq's illegal weapons programs, its attempts to hide those weapons from inspectors, and its links to terrorist groups. Let me take you inside that intelligence file and share with you what we know from eyewitness accounts. I was looking up and learning about what was going on in the world, and I learned that Saddam Hussein was a Ba'ath socialist, a sec secular leader, and that Osama bin Laden was a, a fanatical Muslim. The idea that these two were aligned didn't seem to make any sense. And again, whenever I, I kind of brought these points up, people just didn't seem interested. Everyone was just kind of like, well, we've been attacked, let's wave the flag, let's go along with it. And I was asking questions. Um, and that's when I started to realize that there was, there was a lot that I was being told in the mainstream media that, that didn't seem accurate. And it was in that context of kind of having, having politics thrust onto me, being encouraged to just, you know, constantly be shouting support our troops and wave the flag after 9-11. And I was just being forced to, to ask questions. If you're so happy to hear me getting censored, are you really a liberal? You're an authoritarian. You can't compete with my ideas, so you call me a Nazi though you can't produce any proof of me being a Nazi, in fact, it's the contrary. You want to censor me because there's footage of me 20 years ago and 15 years ago protesting the Aryan Nations and KKK. That's the kind of videos you censor of mine because you want to put out this straw man of Alex Jones so you can destroy that person's character and assassinate who I am, but you don't want to actually go after who I am. So it's the last bastion of traitors, the last bastion of tyrants and authoritarians try to censor. Glad uh, that you could join us today for this Wednesday, July 25th, 2001 broadcast. Tyranny is enveloping the globe, and the United States is a shining jewel the globalists want to bring down, and they will use terrorism as the pretext to get it done. Saddam Hussein is a homicidal dictator who is addicted to weapons of mass destruction. We're aware of who the terrorists are if you pull this. This can stop the Sindlerian Reichstag event. And I won't want you to believe Alex Jones. I want With people everywhere publishing their thoughts about America on the web, suspicions grew around the message we were sending to the world. All of a sudden, these concerns were the focus on alternative media platforms and corporate news had competition, which meant the narrative couldn't be controlled. In the 80s, running the Mujahideen War, his family builds all the military bases over in Saudi Arabia right now. This is the board of Iridium satellites. Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda share the same goal boogeyman in this Orwellian phony system. A big part of the solution, after you research all the government terrorism and check out what I'm saying is true, call the White House and tell them, we know the government's planning terrorism. We know Oklahoma City and World Trade Center was terrorism. We know the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted to blow up airliners, Baltimore Sun. If you do it, we're going to blame you because we know who's up to it. Or if you let some terrorist group do it, like the World Trade Center, we know who to blame. And you could save the planet. 9-11 was a major turning point for the world. Our sovereignty was threatened when we traded privacy for security. Hunter S. Thompson offers an important perspective to consider. And uh, then they have this argument, well, you know, if you want to criticize like that, you're making fun of the uh, victims or people who died in the uh, disastrous uh, crashes. I'm still not sure who did that. And I think there's a lot more to it than we have been allowed to know over here. You know, the media is not a, uh, doesn't reflect world opinion or uh, even a larger, more intelligent opinion over here. It's just, it's just this drumbeat of uh, celebrity worship and uh, child funerals and uh, 
you know, hooded prisoners being led around uh, Guantanamo. No, I'm uh, I'm very disturbed about the, uh, the civil rights implications of this, and everybody should be. In the 90s, people thought the internet could be ignored. The Drudge Report changed that when they ran the Monica Lewinsky story. I didn't have the internet back then, but I'd bet the people that did weren't expecting Drudge's website to be the first to break that news. As the first guy who has made a name for himself on the internet, I've been invited to more and more high-tone gatherings such as this. The last being a conference on internet and society and some word I couldn't pronounce up at Harvard a week ago. And I mention this not just to blow my own horn, but to make a point. Exalted minds, the panelists in the audience whose average IQ exceeds the Dow Jones, didn't appear to have a clue what this internet's gonna do, what we're going to make of it, what we're gonna, uh, what this is all gonna turn into. But I have glimpses, and sometimes deep in the middle of the night, I tell them to Bill Paley. We have entered an era vibrating with the din of small voices. Every citizen can be a reporter, can take on the powers that be. Drudge's speech made us realize the world seemed bigger before the internet. With everyone and everything connecting, we entered a period of adjustment where cultures, government, and ideologies blended into something new. Jeremy does a good job pointing out some of the issues this adjustment period brought on. There, there is a war on journalism right now. And in, in some countries, like Mexico, it comes in the form of journalists being assassinated on an almost weekly basis. The Justice Department had collected phone logs for 20 telephone lines used by more than 100 reporters and editors. Prosecutors also subpoenaed and seized cell phone records of several AP journalists. When a journalist is killed, the news dies too. A whole society can be forgotten simply because there is no one left to tell their stories. Tice disappeared outside Damascus in 2012. As the internet fills with new journalists, the search for news leads investigators into the shadows, where they inevitably uncover stories that prompt retaliation. And because we're in a world where people are killed over secrets, sources are hard to come by. When all accountability is gone, reality is compromised. A scathing new report blasting the Obama administration's treatment of journalists. The 30-page report written by a former Washington Post executive editor. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. Mainstream media, the sock puppet, rodeo clown. You know what a rodeo clown is? Remember what the rodeo clown is? A rodeo clown is the guy that went out and tried to save the bull rider when he was thrown. And as the advancing bull is about to squash this guy, the rodeo clown comes up and says, hey, over here, look, and he distracts. When all three branches of the government are colluding against the interests of the people, it's the responsibility of journalists and, and journalism at large to hold them accountable. What motivates a person to dedicate their time to research that may or may not show return? Is it because getting it right can be so rewarding? I've realized that you need to care to be a journalist. You need to care about the effects of something, anything. In fact, if you care about the effects of something, you should be a journalist, even if it's just for one story. I was contacted by a major figure with an anonymous, somebody who had been responsible in part for setting in motion the, the, the massive protests against the Church of Scientology. Uh, back in the beginning of 2010, I had written an article uh, about anonymous for Huffington Post they had recently attacked the Australian government uh, in protest of internet censorship legislation. And it was an effective uh, campaign, just as the Scientology thing had been. And I predicted uh, that this was something new and important, that this was uh, the very first manifestation of what we would see uh, throughout the 21st century, emergence, civilian uh, processes at war with institutional systems and that eventually these processes would be able to overcome these systems. You know, the Stratfor emails were taken from Stratfor by a couple of associates of mine uh, back in December. And after there was some discussion about what to do with them, whether to release them all, all, all five point two million of them into the public, as had been the case with other early releases like H.B. Gary. H.B. Gary is a intelligence contracting firm. It's one of uh, hundreds, perhaps, uh, private firms, oftentimes staffed with former military, former intelligence officials, uh, a lot of software engineers, that cater to the U.S. governments and other states, uh, and also cater to corporations. 
in the market of black ops, uh, surveillance, uh, espionage, disinformation campaigns. Uh, a bunch more things have been gleaned by people I know uh, and by my, some of my people within Project PM and others just out there who are kind of, I guess we're all sort of engaging in one of these crowdsourced uh, kind of in, uh, sort of investigation campaigns. And these guys apparently have access to top secret information. You know, it's a, it's a little bit better than what you read in the normal newspaper, but it's not classified information. If these were all really ethical people with who, who thought, you know, long term and who were intellectually honest uh, and who were competent, we'd have a lot less to worry about, uh, you know, no matter how high end these capabilities keep getting, and they are getting very high end. They were looking for uh, an informant who knew information about Hugo Chavez, right? Mm -hmm. And he says of this informant, if this is a source you suspect may have value, you have to take control of him. Control means financial, sexual, or psychological control to the point where he would reveal his sourcing and be tasked. Some of them sound like conspiracy theory stuff. It, it makes the, the public less and less equipped to really understand uh, why we should all be frightened by this. Is this going to get worse in 2012? I think so. I've just never seen any single indication whatsoever that hasn't uh, increased my concern about what's going on in this wider surveillance, data mining, propaganda industry. President Obama has been absolutely vigilant in going after whistleblowers. He said he would protect them during the campaign. It's been the exact opposite. He has filed more Espionage Act uh, charges than the rest of the presidents combined. And you don't have to have a journalism degree or some J school uh, sheepskin to be able to tell the truth. And right now, as we speak, all over the world, in apartments and homes and basements, that's right, with great production facilities, there are young people and old people and people of every texture there is, everybody on the phylogenetic tree, they're all putting out news and it scares the hell out of the CNNs and the MSDNZs and others. In my gut, studying history, I've known that as the establishment corrupted the media and journalism so much to become its tool of propaganda, that it would make itself obsolete and that into that vacuum would come a new renaissance or a whole new wave uh, of journalists, pundits, and just people seeing the world for what it really was from their perspective, not putting it through a political or even a cultural filter. And now with the internet, it's given people this incredible opportunity to express themselves in billions of different ways. And there's no way that the big four networks can compete with that now. I mean, just a few years ago, you'd see the nightly news on all four networks with the same stories in the same order with the same script. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless. Especially on a birthday. And we know that was beyond the CIA and Project Mockingbird, which was admittedly government control over mainstream media. If you don't know who Mockingbird is, you're probably an American. <laughs> it was the corporations so closely aligned in the agenda they wanted that the corporate bosses were getting together and were actually involved in a form of technocracy or private corporate governance through a mass electronic system to program and control the public. So we're already really seeing the organic rebellion against the centralization of culture long before we were supposed to have this big fight with AI. The internet itself interfacing with humans is what's actually overturning the older technotronic system. I like interviewing people, and I realized that a friend of mine knew Andrew Breitbart. And at the time, Andrew was like the most hated person on the right. He was the most despised individual uh, out there. And so therefore, I wanted to interview him, because like that's inherently interesting to me. So I called up Andrew, and the first time we talked, we talked for three hours. We hit it off immediately. He was not at all who I expected him to be. We talked about Depeche Mode and the Smiths and uh, 80s music that we liked, and we talked about our kids, and we talked about politics and stuff, too. But he was a big Letterman fan. He's a big Howard Stern fan, a, a Hunter Thompson fan and stuff. And so the guy wasn't who I expected him to be. Countless people, from Michael Medved to Dennis Prager to Sean Hannity, are showing people or granting people a perspective 
uh, or the alternative reality from the mainstream media. He was working for the Drudge Report when the Monica Lewinsky story broke, one of the key, the, basically the birth of modern new media digital journalism, right? The Huffington Post was his idea. Andrew Breitbart, then after he left the Drudge Report, worked for Ariana Huffington, where it was his idea. He went to Ariana and he said, you need to use your golden Rolodex to create the Huffington Post. And again, the birth of the Huffington Post, major milestone in the history of digital journalism. We're now 20 plus years into this new media revolution. And the difference is, is there is open media warfare to understand why there was hype around Andrew's death, you'll have to look into what motivated him. And these kids I feel sorry for here who are sitting around with their gender studies degrees and $200,000 in debt crying that the system failed them. And they did. They won't, be, they won't be able to afford their first down payment on a house until they're 45 years old. The journalism departments are a political front operation in order to create a social justice, economic justice uh, movement that uses uh, journalism, accredited journalists, as a means to create the American narrative. It's, it is a racket. Journalism school in this country is for the most part a racket. I wanted to be a revolutionary more than a journalist. I was kind of an unusual child, and I read uh, the works of Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman, a couple of the uh, early anarchist uh, revolutionaries in the early 20th century. And, uh, but uh, I was interested in writing, and uh, I determined that journalism would be the best uh, manner by which to bring changes about. Later I realized I was wrong, and that journalism only goes so far, and that's why I became a journalist. Battles in the press elevated citizen journalists from all sides to center stage in the political sphere. The Barack Obama met a bunch of silver ponytails back in the 1980s, like Bill and Bernadine Dorn. That there is no one left, but the FBI does not agree. Okay, All the agents have All given right. up intense hunts for the radicals. Mr. Ayers is not involved in my campaign. He uh, has never been involved in this campaign, and he will not advise me in the White House. I knew Barack Obama, absolutely, and I knew him probably as well as thousands of other Chicagoans. And like millions and millions of other people worldwide, I wish I knew him better right now. But thousands of people were not asked to help start his political career in their home. They had real money from real capitalists who gave it on to their children and their children's children, and then they become communists. Barack Obama is a radical. We should not be afraid to say that. The same new media that he'd helped create spread fake news lies about his death. Andrew Breitbart had a uh, congenital heart condition. He'd been in the hospital a year before for the heart condition. I knew about it, a number of people knew about it. Sean Hannity knew about it and talked about it after Andrew's death. I talked to Andrew three hours before he died. One of the things he said to me in that phone call was that he'd had a heart pang on a plane the night before. He didn't know what it was at the time, and I didn't know what it was at the time. He, what he said was, he said, I was on a plane last night, and I felt, you know, I felt something weird in my heart. He said, I think it's all the arrows I take getting attacked for people. That, that was one of the last things he said to me. Of course, alternative and mainstream media are both just as guilty of yellow journalism. So it can be impossible to get the whole truth from anywhere. Where's the line between speculation and manipulation? Sometimes questions are valid. Sometimes they're not. There's people that believe censoring is the only way to prevent someone from influencing the public with false information. But doing that limits our ability to prevent the corruption of those that have the power to silence others. Mistakes are often the result of great intentions. No argument there. But I'd say it's kind of hard to prove intentions. Some theories circulating on the internet are easy to disprove, while others raise major questions. You know, it's this paranoid tendency psychologically that we have um, when we don't have the answers, we make up stories. That's suspicion, that's paranoia. So, you know, the, the one thing that we can do for ourselves is to be able to hold, hold space for the fact that the people we put into power are humans, right? They're humans just like us. Somehow, you know, with power, we assume comes this God complex, right? But 
what, what is that about? That's not rational. They're still human. And we need to hold space for the fact that they're going to act in human ways, which also means making mistakes. We all need to ask questions. But what are we supposed to do when asking gets us in trouble? Would a government official really use their powers to go after a journalist? We have the Pentagon spokesperson, which General Crystal was, at the time of the invasion of Iraq, telling me we totally co-opted the media on that one. Hastings wrote the Rolling Stone article with General Stanley McChrystal's remarks about the Afghanistan war. I think it's clear that uh, the article in which he and his team appeared uh, showed a poor, uh, showed poor judgment. Soon after its release, President Obama was accepting General McChrystal's resignation. Now I can imagine Hastings was hated for his work, but he was protected by the First Amendment. And the question is, have we learned from that? And sadly, I don't know if we have. WikiLeaks says Michael Hastings contacted WikiLeaks lawyer Jennifer Robinson just a few hours before he died. He, you know, he was seen looking under his car with his brother. It's hard to ignore these interviews with Joe Biggs. He seemed genuinely concerned with the events surrounding Hastings' death, and his message sounded sincere, so we explored the possibility of foul play. You know how people are going to react to this. They're going to say that the, the tinfoil hat people think the government killed this journalist. Uh, by taking exactly. over his control, his car, doing something to his car, and and the other people are going to say, uh, so there are people going to say that's that's nuts. Your thoughts? But like I said, he's not someone that would be driving around erratically like that in the middle of the night. That just wasn't how he was. Um, so that just leaves a lot of questions and a lot of digging that need to be brought up and answered. I'm not going to speculate and say I think anything because that's just going to make me look crazy. The Obama administration has clearly declared war on, on the press. It's declared war on uh, investigative journalists, our sources. I think the only recourse to this kind of behavior by the government is to say back to the government, we declare war on you. What was Hastings investigating before he died that would lead people to think he was murdered? Do you subscribe to any of this? Do you have any idea really what may have You know, I have no doubt that he was pursuing a hot story. He always had at least five hot stories right. going. That was, that was Michael. So, uh, and he also, there, he, there will be published his profile of John Brennan in an upcoming issue of Rolling Stone um, probably in a couple of weeks. Because no one else is going to defend the press. The theories around Hastings' car accident had us following crumbs that led us to dozens of stories of activists exposing the the wrongdoings of companies like Stratfor. For those who don't know, Stratfor is a private intelligence company that some are calling a shadow CIA. I didn't know. I didn't think I needed to know until now. A professor of philosophy at Northwestern University has been tracking the case of Barrett Brown and wrote a nation piece about him, the strange case of Barrett Brown. Democracy Now! is one of the few news outlets that covered the fallout of the Stratfor hacks. So his, the FBI raids his home and um, he ultimately is arrested. He faces 100 years in prison. Yeah, if you add up all the charges and if he serves them sequentially, it'll be 105 years in prison. Yeah, that's right. The first grand jury sort of secret search warrants for my online communications uh, were requested very shortly after we had revealed the DOJ's involvement in the Team Themis scandal with H.P. Gary and these other firms. Uh, over time, you know, we, of course, we knew, all of us knew that we were being monitored uh, in different ways and that we were being uh, pursued. Thanks to another fucking stroke of luck, thank God, that H.B. Gary, since mid-February, had hired an FBI informant who was already an FBI informant, already had been bitching the FBI about this other nonsense about Greg House for fucking years. A paid IB, uh, FBI informant who the FBI pur purchased supplies for, or paid, you know, gave some money to buy supplies because she was so helpful to them in making shit up and uh, picking up reasons to raid Barrett Brown and get his information they wanted for other reasons, uh, that she was in the employee of fucking H.B. Gary and working straight with Greg Hoagland, the fucking CEO, who's already been caught, already been caught last year. Uh, you know, there were hacks against our infrastructure. Uh, there was weird disinformation campaigns, that kind of thing. Later on, we uh, found out from the Snowden emails that the GCHQ, uh, Britain's, one of Britain's intelligence services had a nice big file of ideas on how they could go after Anonymous in different ways. And some of those stratagems laid out there kind of coincided with some of the stuff that had happened to me, uh, certain kinds of phone attacks, for instance. And later on, uh, the FBI, as they pursued me... Uh, we don't play all our hands like they do. Uh, anyway, so that's why uh, Robert Smith's life is over. 
And when I say his life is over, I don't say I'm going to go kill him. But I'm going to ruin his life and look into his fucking kids. Because Aaron Barr did the same thing. And he didn't get rated for it. How do you like the apples? Uh, they uh, put out a search warrant for my house and for my uh, mother's house as well. And uh, served that search warrant. And the search warrant uh, listed for subjects of inquiry. H.P. Uh, Gary, the same company we had exposed. In-Game Systems, another company that had been involved in that that we had exposed and which had later been found to have uh, dealt in zero days, uh, controlling, for instance, airports in France uh, for potential customers. Uh, and our website, echelon2.org, on which we compiled our information, and Project PM, the, the group that I was using to conduct this crowdsourced research. There was no mention of Stratfor, but months later, when they had already arrested me, uh, for threatening a federal agent. Oh, is Barrett getting fucking raided by the FBI? Yes. Holy shit! Oh, oh. And they still needed something to justify the investigation. They listed my involvement in the Stratford hack, which of course I hadn't actually hacked, not being a hacker. Uh, those are the charges I was actually uh, uh, dealt. And so many of those charges eventually were dropped by the government because they were nonsense. Uh, but uh, this was enough to kind of show, even to the New York Times, even to sort of slow on the uptake outlets, that something was wrong here, that my entire prosecution had been retaliation for our work in exposing the DOJ's own practices. Stories like Barrett's definitely contribute to the rising number of activists butting heads with intelligence officials. What's going to happen when everyone loses faith? You know, I really did not uh, anticipate the the attempt of censorship through this entire fake news rubric, but it, it's really kind of logical. Prior to the technological advances that meant that most Americans got their political information through a computer device, and therefore through the internet, ABC, NBC, CBS, and then later CNN and Fox had a monopoly, a stranglehold on the dissemination of political information. It was only because of the technological advances and the internet that you had the rise in a, a vibrant, uh, robust alternative media. Wake up, people. I guess it was four years ago, uh, 2012, in the presidential contest, I was supporting uh, governor Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, who was the Libertarian Party nominee. Uh, despite the fact that I have spent a lifetime as a Republican, had a long sentimental attachment to the old Republican Party of Barry Goldwater, the party of small government, lower taxes, strong national defense. The nomination of Mitt Romney convinced me that that party no longer existed. Uh, and I joined the Libertarians. During that campaign, I saw Alex Jones' coverage and a great interview he did with Governor Johnson, and I became a fan. What's your take on the debate last night? I mean, you obviously uh, wanted to be there, but I guess the two-party system kept you out. We actually first met at the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination in Dallas. It really wasn't until 2016 that we became compatriots uh, and fellow warriors in the info wars because Alex Jones very early um, recognized the independence and the outsider nature of Donald Trump's candidacy. People like Roger, he's a tough cookie, I will tell you that, but people like him, but he's been so loyal and so wonderful, and he is the one, he really wanted me to do this interview. Whether Trump is gonna win or not, clearly the big corporate money from both political parties that had had a monopoly for the last hundred years was betting on Hillary and Jeb Bush early on. An official announcement coming from Hillary Clinton. I'm a candidate for president of the United States of America. I am officially running for president of the United States. I know what you're saying. I know he's nobody's favorite. I understand this. But understand what he did. He beat 16 of the best and the brightest and the, well, but the brightest, but the best and the most moneyed Republicans they had. He kicked their ass. Do you understand that? He wiped them up. I don't mean he just won. I mean he destroyed them. And Hillary. And Bernie Sanders. And everyone. And he had nobody. 
He didn't have the media. He didn't have anybody. He had these things called, oh, what's the word? Oh, yes, voters. I was just about as dumb as everybody. I, I assumed it was a foregone conclusion that Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush were going to uh, have the clash of Democratic and Republican dynasties, and it was going to be boring and especially boring for people like us, whose job it is to, to comment on it. Raise your hand now if you won't make that pledge tonight. Boy, that sounds pretty stupid now, doesn't it? I should have used two accounts, one for personal, one for uh, work-related emails. There's a genuine risk here that she's not as strong a month or two from now. I want to talk not about my emails. War should be the last resort. For every poll we have, with an overwhelming majority saying that Bernie Sanders had a massive win, you have a headline on a newspaper, on a website, saying, no, it was Hillary Clinton's night. People wonder if fake news changed the election. It probably did. It always does. It's just really hard to prove. Just like it's really hard to prove something was hacked after the evidence was played with. Before the Hillary Trump accusations were flying, there were rumors of hacking within the DNC. The data breach resulted in the hiring of CrowdStrike to examine their servers, instead of the FBI. Even after the FBI's numerous requests. Why? An independent investigation about all of the breaches that have occurred from day one in this campaign, because I am not convinced that information from our campaign may not have ended up in her campaign. Don't know that. Last point. When we saw the breach two months ago, we didn't run into the media and make a big deal about it. I really wanted to see the two-party duopoly, the Clintons, the Bushes, have to fight hard for an election, but also I didn't want to see either of them succeed. And it wasn't about politics, left, right, Democrat, Republican. It was more about the idea of the establishment and uh, forces in the media and in politics dictating to the people what they needed to vote for, who they needed to vote for, and how they received their news. Watching the primaries was gut-wrenching. People left common sense and understanding behind that take sides and fight for their candidate. Absorbed by whatever reality their group was promoting, they shut down, ignoring any opposition to their thoughts. Why were so many people ignoring the issues that other people were focused on? Maybe Yuri has an answer. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. I did not vote for Trump. I don't agree with him on a lot of issues, police brutality, immigration. I'm just not with him at all. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. The fact that he was upsetting the apple cart was something that made him very, very uh, appealing to me. I have read so much about the emails. Folks, honestly, she's guilty as hell. Almost every day there was another story that was focused on sculpting our opinions. Years later, questions still remain. What really happened with Russia? On June 14th, 2016, the Washington Post publishes the first article that breaks the Trump-Russia story. Russian-affiliated hackers were inside their network. We get some insight on how this happened and why from Dmitry Alperovich. He's the founder of CrowdStrike. The reports from CrowdStrike about the DNC hack had us anticipating the next red scare. The reports were confusing and left a lot of people wondering what Fancy and Cozy Bear actually were. They'd done dozens of events. This is according to CrowdStrike. In none of those hacks had they created an entity with a WordPress account and a Twitter account like Guccifer 2. I first contacted Guccifer 2 in July of 2016. They got back to me a couple weeks later. Very, you know, very talkative. Hi, would you like some data? Here you go, here's some data. So I still have no idea who Guccifer 2 was, but I don't think now, and I never thought, that it was any foreign power. I don't think it was Russia, I don't think it was any foreign power, because none of the way they acted, whoever, whoever Guccifer 2 is, fit what I would expect an intelligence agency to act like. In other words, the MO, the modus operandi, of these hackers had been set. They would basically go in, they'd get data, and then they'd put it out. But this one was suddenly different. Despite Dimitri's attempt to be transparent in this interview, suspicions grew. I can't help but think how the announcement of an official FBI investigation could have prevented all the speculation. We're able to get access to the communication service at the DNC, essentially giving them ability to monitor the email traffic that was going through those servers, and a completely separate actor that penetrated that network 
at, in April of this year and went straight for the research department at the Democratic National Committee, specifically looking for the opposition files on uh, the Republican uh, presidential candidate, Donald Trump. The initial reason the CrowdStrike was brought in is there were accusations that Bernie Sanders people had basically hacked the DNC and had illegally gotten into the voter rolls. So the DNC hires CrowdStrike, they look into it, and sure enough, since they're working for the DNC, sure enough, CrowdStrike says, yes, the Bernie Sanders people did this. Now, you might remember Bernie Sanders had to literally sue the DNC during the primaries to get access to the voter information. CrowdStrike, which is run by this um, Russian exile, uh, anti-Putin Russian exile, Dmitry Alperovich, and he's a fellow at the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank in Washington that's funded by the defense industry, and Viktor Pinchuk, the Ukrainian billionaire who also funded the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation is not a charity, it's a slush fund for grifters. It's a vehicle for the facilitation of multi-million dollar bribes. The Bushes and the Clintons have worked very closely together to enrich each other through their phony charities where most of the money disappears. The many Clinton charities, it's not just the one, they all have to report. There's a lot of information in the public domain. They can't get away with their typical approach of saying, this is confidential, we're not going to tell you. You have to tell the public what you're doing. The reports they filed are all littered with errors. And the big question is not only why were the Clintons doing this, but why were regulators under the Bush administration and then under the Obama administration letting the Clinton Foundation frauds escalate into the enormous scale they now are of over two billion in declared revenues and possibly more than a hundred billion in total undeclared activity. Every time we hear about the Clinton Foundation and the alternative media, back channels of the elite and globalist agendas come up. There's paranoia all over the internet about these powerful people trying to change the world behind closed doors. So at the end of the day, you know, I, I even know psychologists who understand that manipulation is a very effective tool to getting their clients to change their behaviors, right? To getting their patients to behave in a more optimal way. But ultimately, I think that that's, um, that's treating our patients as if they're children, you know? And what we need to do for each other, and particularly with media and the way that we approach media, is to speak to people in a way that helps elevate them. Even if they don't understand everything, let's explain terms. You know, let's get on the same page. Um, but at least then we're having an elevated discussion rather than I'm talking down to you or I'm manipulating you as if you're a child. If we take the time to explain details to each other instead of dismissing questions or leaving someone out of a conversation, we become closer and understand each other. Maybe people in power should think about this before they have secret meetings on tarmacs. At the time of Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton's meeting, she was overseeing the FBI investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. They claimed their meeting was strictly social and had nothing to do with the investigation. But the simple fact that those two are social fuels suspicions that Comey's report could have been influenced. Former President Bill Clinton was in town and met up with U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Lynch then told us there was no discussion of Benghazi of State Department emails involving Hillary Clinton. From June to November 2016, there were so many major headlines that it became impossible to keep track of any current event. Information fell through the cracks. And this is really an arrogant declaration of independence against the rule of law. Although there is evidence of potential violations of the statutes regarding the handling of classified information, our judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. This is not to suggest that in similar circumstances, a person who engaged in this activity would face no consequences. There were times in the campaign where I was kind of applauding for him, I must say. He lost the FBI primary Bernie, my poor Bernie. So you have a rogue email system set up before she took the oath of office. Thousands of what we now know to be classified emails, some of which were classified at the time. One of her more frequent email comrades was in fact hacked, and you don't know whether or not she was. And this scheme took place over a long period of time and resulted in the destruction of public records, and yet you say there is insufficient evidence of intent. You say she was extremely careless, but not intentionally so. 
Positions of power have a tendency to draw narcissists in because those kinds of personalities covet power. You know, they love power, they love to hold on to that power, and the ego is very strong in those personalities. So they they get a rush, they get a, you know, a real sort of adrenaline thing happening in their bodies around holding power and actually knowing that they're in a superior position and wielding that power um, to, to pander to those that are inferior, let's say. And it works both ways too, right? Because even if you're not a narcissist chasing power, you end up in a powerful position, some amount of narcissism inherently happens because now you've got people who are sort of playing to that God complex. So what comes next? What comes when the plans of the powerful don't work out? The next stage is destabilization. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise, fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. All I know is that this, this must stop. This divisiveness. It's Hillary for prison, 2016. Right, that's not yeah. for the Hillary camp. No, I don't think so. Her bad instincts and her bad judgment, something pointed out by Bernie Sanders, Let's review the record. Despite heavy opposition within the Republican Party, Trump's loyal followers stood by, eager to celebrate a new era in politics. What was it? Was it his promise to take on the elite? Or were people actually convinced his business before politics attitude would stop the global consolidation of power? Americanism, not globalism, will be our credo. Days after the Republican National Convention, WikiLeaks dropped some news that led to drama in Philadelphia. I asked and demanded uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz's resignation many, many months ago. It was boisterous on the floor. I will definitely give you that. And you're saying this is a symbolism of the death of the Democratic Party uh, due to the fact that the DNC and democracy. United together? Right. That's, I mean, now it's a joke. In the minds of millions of Sanders supporters, the DNC has proven that they do not care about the people they are supposed to represent. And when it comes from the DNC chief financial officer, not some, you know, low-level person, we got a problem at yep. the DNC. When an aide reported to Wasserman Schultz, Sanders vowed to remain in the race to the end. The DNC chair replied, spoken like someone who has never been a member of the Democratic Party and has no understanding of what we do. She really lost credibility over the past couple of years, especially with the rise of Bernie Sanders and what we saw happen to Bernie with all the trickery and all all of the, frankly, illegal stuff that they did to steal the nomination from him. Debbie Wasserman Schultz star has fallen. She is persona non grata at most events in Florida among the Democratic Party. They don't even want her on the, the headliner for fundraising. People aren't calling for endorsements anymore. It's been a long fall and it's only going to get worse for her. The Clinton campaign cast the emails and the sentiments they captured as irrelevant to the outcome of the nomination battle waged this spring. The choice is clear, my friends. After the WikiLeaks saga, you know, I think myself and many people that I know uh, were deeply agitated, to put it mildly. And that's because a lot of the trust that we had placed in the way that our elections are run in a democracy, which, you know, should go hand in hand with fairness, right, justice, um, it felt like that wasn't the case. It felt like we couldn't trust the way that we're voting and the outcomes that happen as a result of our voting. So they're speaking of being demoralized, right? That was happening en masse with people who I think just felt like, what's the point of voting? Now listen carefully. I'm a lawyer by profession, okay? And I know this thing about proof. The thing that amazed me about WikiLeaks was that they never talked about whether what WikiLeaks ever advanced was true. Authenticity and authenticating the issues were never a product. See, I don't really give a damn kind of where you got it from. Is it true? Is it true? They never talked about that. I don't think anyone voted for Trump because of WikiLeaks. I think that's a little bit of absurd. I don't think I met anyone who said, well, I was going to vote for Hillary Clinton until I saw those WikiLeaks. I don't think so. I think that perhaps the Bernie Sanders base you know, was able to hold up something and have proof of what a lot of them knew in their guts, which was that it was rigged against them. And I think that that's what, that's what the revelations from WikiLeaks did. I think it had that impact. It gave them, you know, a smoking gun. It was hard to see what WikiLeaks was actually doing because of all the talk in the media. But this NBC interview cleared some things up. 
Maybe Roger Stone was just investigating like everyone else was. There really is nothing new about the U.S. and Russia spying on each other. Because I had a source who told me in early August that WikiLeaks had a massive amount of information about Hillary Clinton that was devastating. I know you have another, so there's a lot of speculation that you have more information. Uh, and that source continued to tell me through August, September, that this was coming. Are you timing your leaks for maximum impact on the Clinton campaign? I didn't hear this from Julian Assange. I heard it from a source who heard it from Assange or someone in the Assange camp. But more importantly, on July 31st, long before I predicted it, WikiLeaks tweeted the following. We're timing our leaks to make sure that A, that they're verified, that we keep our 100% track record, B, that they're formatted, indexed, uh, and in a position where investigative journalists can use them, where the public can use them, mm -hmm. uh, where lawyers can use them as pristine uh, documents, where prosecutors can use them. We have a great track record of contributing to hundreds of legal cases right. uh, and prosecutions, let alone uh, what happens in terms of political accountability. Uh, that's how we choose our timing. Hardly a state secret. How either one of those things constitutes collusion with the Russians, I don't know. The closer we got to election day, the more overwhelming the battle between the left and right became. WikiLeaks wasn't the only group attacking Hillary, and Hillary wasn't the only one bashing Trump. First of all, it's rigged. And I'm afraid the election's gonna be rigged, I have to be honest. Of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? ISIS will hand her the most valuable player award. Her only competition is Barack Obama. Hillary Clinton attacked InfoWars because John Podesta and her advisors basically saw it as the lead elephant to take down. They knew that we had broken a lot of big stories that had damaged them in the past, that had exposed uh, their fraud and the fact that they were so disingenuous. A man with a long history of racial discrimination who traffics in dark conspiracy theories. Now, we'd been foes for 20 years by even that period of time. But also because I come off as a little bit wild and shoot from the hip sometimes, they thought I was weak. Alex Jones, who claims that 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings were inside jobs. He even said and this really just is so disgusting. He even said the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre were child actors. They thought because I wasn't scripted and didn't have these big think tanks behind me that I'd be a good poster boy for what they called fake news or the dark heart Alex Jones. And that they could then assassinate my character and use that to assassinate the character of all new independent media, be it left, right, center, libertarian, religious, agnostic, it didn't matter. In September, I started to wonder if the Democrats hadn't nominated the weakest candidate in my lifetime. You can put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. The uh, way that the election was being covered wasn't really reflecting the mood of the public, which was a very anti-establishment mood. It's a policy that's shared by Hillary Clinton, whose campaign converged with the deep state. Um, Hillary Clinton's State Department uh, was very much involved in the arming of the Syrian rebels, the, the training of Syrian rebels as proxy forces. Uh, weapons flows going over to, to Syria have uh, been pushed uh, by Hillary Clinton uh, into um, jihadists uh, within Syria, including ISIS. Uh, that's there in those emails. Well, I think you could start by uh, looking at the positions that Mr. Trump has taken during the course of this campaign. One more consistent with Russian foreign policy. WikiLeaks is the greatest thing that ever happened. WikiLeaks, isn't it sad that our mainstream media should have been doing this the whole time? Where were they? A group of pro-Clinton political operatives talking about stirring up trouble and provoking violence at Trump rallies. Who is really inciting violence at these rallies and protests? You can't unsee what Anderson Cooper's about to show you, no matter what people call it. If anyone's willing to stage anything to manipulate your opinion, how can we trust any campaign? We're starting anarchy here. Huh? People from the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party apparatus and people from the uh, campaign, the Clinton campaign. They have hacked American uh, websites, American accounts of private people, of institutions. Then they have given that information to WikiLeaks for the purpose of putting it on the internet. This has come from the highest levels of the Russian government, clearly from Putin himself. 
in an effort, as 17 of our intelligence agencies have confirmed, to influence our election. In particular in Chicago, people were hurt and people could have been killed in that riot. And that was now all on tape, started by her. Nobody's really supposed to know about me. <laughs> so the Chicago protest, when they shut all that, that was us. It was more him than me, but none of this is supposed to come back to us because we want it coming from people. We don't want it to come from the party. It really does come down to what kind of country we are going to have. Folks so sad when she talks about violence at my rallies and she caused the violence. We unite in the Chicago Trump event will be shut down. All the stories around Russian news interfering with our election made it seem like they got Trump elected. But the polarized tone seen all throughout American media is just as easy to blame. We can't accuse Russia and then ignore all the ridiculous media that was created by each campaign. It's very interesting to me that so many senators, so many congresspeople, and a lot of American political figures are obsessively engrossed in the idea of Russia meddling in our elections, because what has the U.S. done for decades, and some would argue hundreds of years, we've been meddling in other people's elections. Donald Trump is uniquely unqualified. The notion of what it meant to make America great took center stage after the election results were in. Millions flooded the streets and social media to voice their concerns for the future. Hillary to dispute the election. They're going to announce that Russians did it. We can now project the winner of the presidential race. He handed un almost unlimited power to a fascist wannabe. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. At this point in time, the whole country is aware of fake news. They just don't know what news is fake and what isn't. Once the emotions diffused, the country started asking the question, how do we fix this? So-called fake news can have real-world consequences. And the military apparatus of this country is about to be handed over to scum, who are beholden to scum, Russian scum. It really was the big news corporation's fault that Trump won. They gave him a lot of airtime. They treated him as a joke. And in the end, what they did was that they gave hate a giant platform. I think that we are in a rough period right now. And the problem isn't that Americans are any dumber than we used to be. It's that the news that we get and the public conversation that we have is put through such an intense ideological lens at this point. It takes one minute and 40 seconds before President Obama even looks at Trump. To say, all right, there's this piece. Let me take a second here before I hit the share button or before I have an emotional reaction. Let me take a pause, and that's mindfulness, right? The ability to cultivate space between the thing that's triggering us and our reaction to it, and allowing us to take that pause and then say, all right, do I, do I have other perspectives in my brain somewhere that I've heard or that I know of that might either balance this support it or disagree with it. It's very hard to define what fake news is, right? Is fake news, is it, is it you know, reporting something that's completely false? Is it lying through omission? Um, is, it, is it, you know, phrasing things in a way that are against the main, what is fake news? I don't really know what fake news is. Fake news was one of the sources of blame um, that, you know, if people had just been adequately informed and they knew the truth, that the mainstream media has been telling them, that the legitimate media of Wolf Blitzer and Thomas Friedman have been telling them all along, then they would have made the right decision, but they were tricked by these dodgy news sites, and that flowed effortlessly into the anti-Russian hysteria. The uh, Washington Post is distancing itself from an expert group it used as a source for an article on fake news and so-called Russian propaganda. The Washington Post accused uh, 200 US news sites of being, quote, routine peddlers of Russian propaganda. The list it was referring to was put together by a little-known collective called Prop or Not. I only look at the Washington Post when, whenever, it, it's like, I, whenever I watch mainstream media is to see what what kind of lunacy they're they're uh, per perpetuating i also want to go back historically um because there's been a lot of talk always to watergate that was 45 years ago the washington post used to really be something now that bezos came in and basically just robbed it of its soul 
I don't pay attention to it. But but here is something. Prop or not, they couldn't even explain who it was. They couldn't even verify it. Such horse shit. But anyways, I, uh, that's not for the movie. I just these people, man. You can put it in there if you want, but it's just... It's so it's like saying I'm not a Easter bunny from Mars, you know. It's but um, so what are you gonna do when the world wakes up to the fact you're a globalist and that you're controlling America for the multinational combines and you've been so arrogant you've written hundreds of books and thousands of white papers admitting it? What are you gonna do? The old enemy, the Russians, yes, and they're communists and they're gonna get us and they're under every table and every bed. And we're coming into an era in which many many different parties uh, with with uh, an array of powers, economic and political, are going to have previously uh, inconceivable abilities to manage the conversation, to manufacture events, uh, and to otherwise further torch our information stream beyond what it's already uh, endured from our own media's incompetence. The deep state, the two-party duopoly, the elites of both parties who really have only one political philosophy are still in shock. First, they tried to uh, argue that uh, the popular vote <clears throat> should have elected Hillary. Now, I thought this was interesting because I had written a piece for The Hill, a newspaper, uh, about voter fraud and my concerns that the computerized voting machines that are in wide use across this country are very easily hacked and manipulated. Uh, and I was widely derided as a conspiracy theorist, as a nut job, and so on. Media Matters for America and the criminal David Brock, who runs it, uh, was particularly vicious in uh, the attacks on me. Fast forward, Trump wins the election. Hillary Clinton and Jill Stein file a request for a recount in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Uh, on the due date for their argument, they have only one. With these machines, which are extremely unreliable, prone to error and uh, human error and machine error, as well as to hacking. Such is the hypocrisy of the Clintons. Facebook has just officially declared war on the truth and dissent. President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act into law. Within the NDAA is another law known as the Countering Disinformation and Propaganda Act. Now, this act was initially introduced by Senators Rob Portman, a Republican from Ohio, and Democrat Chris Murphy. Countering propaganda, whether it come from Russia or China or other sources, isn't about trying to substitute uh, ideas coming from Moscow about the direction of a nation with ideas coming from Washington for the direction of a nation. It's to make sure that the information is available for people abroad to make decisions for themselves. This is a really slippery slope. To me, this is, uh, violates the First Amendment. Uh, it's, it's Stalinistic type censorship and it's designed to limit voices of dissent against the government, against the deep state. So this law essentially funds U.S. propaganda, but isn't that illegal? It was, but no, not anymore, because three years ago, wrapped inside the 2013 NDAA, was an amendment that removed the ban on the U.S. government creating propaganda and then showing it to U.S. citizens. That ban, by the way, had been in place since 1948. Long before fake news became a major media topic, the U.S. government was already planning its legally backed crackdown on anything that would eventually label fake news. Ministry of Truth. Reports on this bill vary. Some praise the creation of the Global Engagement Center as a much needed tool to counter disinformation. Some see it as a weapon for establishment figures to squash their competition with shady methods. The thing is, you can describe it in different ways and influence someone's interpretation of what's happening. And people with loose interpretations can turn into real problems. No matter how the government interacts with the media, it's going to be questioned. We found another Michael Hastings article. This one pointed to the removal of a ban on American scene media content created by our State Department and the Independent Broadcasting Board of Governors. Like so many others, we questioned what this meant. Could our government now create content for us to see? Or is it just making it legal for Americans to see all the old content created? Hastings was concerned with people like John Brennan using the power of government to attack journalists. This made us think about the story he never released, and figures like Corn Meyer manipulating the truth from the shadows. Giving government the ability to do so is a horrifying proposition. The creation of the Global Engagement Centers brings us closer to that reality. 
They were so arrogant in pushing this hoax. They even had multiple House and Senate committees hold hearings where they said, well, we know RT messed with the election and also InfoWars. Just, just with no proof. Just, and we know InfoWars was putting out Russian propaganda. Incredible. Uh, I've seen the bill, and I've seen, of course, uh, other efforts, you know, generally not gone through Congress to allow the U.S. and its components, its various factions in the government to engage in propaganda and to engage in uh, abridgments of speech. Uh, we've seen that this is, this is something that there's a lot of concern about uh, in the intelligence community and the military, and that's been the case uh, since shortly after the Internet became a, a popularized thing. Uh, there are people who are relatively forward-thinking in their terms, uh, who are you know, pragmatic, pro-state kind of people, who understand exactly what the threat is from the internet and from this new ability uh, for people to collaborate uh, on a scale beyond anything we've seen before in history. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. The Democrats in the House and Senate Intelligence Committee and some Republicans like John McCain have promulgated this myth of uh, Russian collusion to help Donald Trump. In my case specifically, the allegation is, A, that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are Russian assets. That's a lie. There is no evidence to that effect. When the intelligence services use the word assessment, when they say something is our assessment, that means they don't know shit. We're supposed to trust our intelligence community, which is fine if you take the time to understand the terms they use, instead of just listening to narratives that make you think the case is already closed. So when they come out and said, it was FBI, CIA, and NSA who said in their report that uh, we have high confidence, well, to me, that immediately meant they're lying. <laughs> I mean, they have not. And the reason I know this is because of all the taps that NSA has on the fibers, and, the, and the, they have embedded into them uh, uh, trace route programs. Now, trace route allows you to follow the path of packets wherever they go. And they've got hundreds of these up in the U.S. and around the world. So, you know, if any packet in the U.S. goes anywhere, they know where it goes. So it didn't, that also told me it didn't go across the net. That was the first thing back in August of 2016 that I said they were lying, you know. And in fact, they are. When you read the FBI report about the hack, there isn't any evidence there. And if you look at their 14-page paper on the 13th page, it says, oh, uh, you shouldn't interpret our, our uh, inferences as having any basis of fact to say this is certainly what happened, you know. <laughs> And they're basically saying right up front, we don't have any evidence. U.S. intelligence has concluded that Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his military to help Donald Trump win the election. Today, the director of national intelligence took the unusual step of releasing an unclassified version of an investigation that details computer hacking, propaganda, and fake news articles. So it is their assessment that Assange is a Russian asset. Then following that, the allegation is that I, because I predicted that John Podesta, the Clinton campaign chairman's business activities in Russia, would come under scrutiny, well, that must have meant that I knew in advance about the hacking of Podesta's emails. I never said anything to that effect. I never claimed anything to that effect. It's supposition. It's conjecture. It's projection. And it's bullshit. Vault 7, the largest ever publication of confidential CIA documents, another Snowden emerges. Yes, let me be specific. This has been leaked by patriots inside the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, so was all the information that you saw unfold during the campaign. None of it came from the Russians. Uh, the problem is not, oh, you know, poor Donald Trump. You're the president, right? You should be asking questions about... Why was this possible in the first place, and why haven't I fixed it? When Vault 7 was released, we thought back to a Cord Meyer interview regarding congressional oversight of the intelligence agencies. Has the congressional oversight of today lost track of what the intelligence community is doing in the digital age? Explain to this audience the restrictions on the CIA recently removed by Congress. The piece of legislation that Carter signed on the 14th of October, which uh, clearly gives to the Senate and House Intelligence Committees the oversight responsibility 
and removes that responsibility as far as covert action is concerned from the purview of six other committees of Congress. Is there an exception in the law for current or former U.S. officials who request anonymity? To, to release classified information? Yes, sir. No. Important to point out that the new legislation gives to these two intelligence committees full access to all information they may need to conduct their inquiries and to ensure their oversight so that the American people can now be assured of the fact that there is competent, continuing legislative oversight, which it seems to me and has always seemed to me to be the best protection against the abuse of secret power. In theory, how would reporters know a U.S. citizen made a telephone call to an agent of foreign power? How would they know legally? Yes. If it was declassified and then discussed in a judicial proceeding or a congressional hearing, something like that. And assume none of those facts are at play, how would they know? Someone told them who shouldn't have told them. I think that by narrowing down the number of committees to only two, mm -hmm. you ha we have, in effect, made it conceivable right. <laughs> and possible yeah. for the president to consider uh, covert action if necessary. Before, I think the president would have been out of his mind to put forward a covert action proposal of any consequence. Uh, with eight committees, uh, their staffs, it added up to over 200 people. Admiral Rogers said there are 20 people within the NSA that are part of the unmasking process. How many people within the FBI are part of the unmasking process? I don't know for sure as I sit here. Surely more, given the nature of the FBI's work, we come into contact with U.S. persons a whole lot more than the NSA does because we may be conducting, we only conduct our operations in the United States to collect electronic sur uh, surveillance, to conduct electronic surveillance. Interactions between the Obama administration and the intelligence community made it impossible to disprove bias in decision making. Do I really think that you guys are going to tell the story that I would like to have told? No. Your story is going to be, Here's a guy, spreads fake news, uses social media. These social media people better cry. I know the story you guys are doing before you do it. What's wrong with that story? I'm somewhat surprised um, in terms of the level of interest that I've seen from the press corps at one set of developments versus another set of developments. It seems that when all eyes are focused on one side of the aisle, someone almost always offers more horrific news to either distract or point fingers at accusers. Could the so-called deep state be behind something like this? In the past years, I think, you know, I've tried to make my voice heard and to oppose intervention in Syria. Um, this is not a policy crafted by Donald Trump. This is a policy he previously opposed. It's a policy that emerges from a series of um, elements. First and foremost, the national security state, what's known commonly as the deep state. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria. Which has been the central base for the Syrian military's anti-ISIS operations. There can be no dispute that Syria used banned chemical weapons. After that attack, we saw ISIS attempt to advance um, in the area outside of the areas it controls because the Syrian army had no air force at that time. I just don't see how it could conceivably be what, what they claim uh, because it's helping ISIS, it's helping Al-Qaeda. This is an area actually controlled by al-Qaeda's Syrian affiliate, Jabhat al-Nusra. And we saw images come out of that chemical attack, which were horrific. And, which, and then we saw Nikki Haley, the UN ambassador, uh, perform atrocity exhibition at the UN with these images in order to overwhelm the international sphere with emotion and subsume any attempt at um, reason, reasoned calm analysis through an independent investigation by the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons. And people, if they wanted a neocon, they would have elected Jeb. All foreign policy emanates from domestic political concerns, particularly with a very weak and unstable figure like Donald Trump. And when the decision was made to attack Syria, it was Donald Trump authorized it from Mar-a-Lago. He was completely out of the loop. And so we've, we're seeing a slow motion process of a deep state takeover. I saw this under Ronald Reagan. The establishment types come to you and say, oh, Mr. President, we have more experience in this area than you do. Uh, and the next thing you know, your policies are reversed or abandoned. 
I can tell you uh, emphatically that there was no one on the White House staff and no one in the administration who openly opposed the proposal to put 150,000 men and women on the ground in Syria. Only one person in the White House was opposed. Thank God that person was Donald Trump. That is an accomplishment of the deep state by destabilizing Libya and destabilizing large parts of Africa, then destabilizing Syria. So these, this element, um, and it's a very real element, I'm not being conspiratorial, that represents to me the true danger on an international scale. So they will take something and they'll say, inside jobs, conspiracy theory, nonsense. Well, what about Russia, perhaps maybe falsely staging something to make it look like, yes, an inside job. Oh, so you like the inside job? Oh, yes. Well, what about um, ISIS or Nusra staging a fake chemical attack in Syria to make it look like Assad? No. Oh, you don't like that now. <laughs> make up your mind. Every peaceful march that turned violent made it more clear that the minds of the masses had been pushed to their limit. Last night, the number one trending topic on Twitter was Obama farewell. And the second trending topic, no kidding, was golden showers. <laughs> I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. And, and I'm sure, I know this was not your intent. I've known you a long time. But you just published fake news. Our goal is to continue to help shut down the cities and like make inauguration a giant clusterfuck. Now arrives the hour of action. With waves of emotion sweeping the nation, we wondered why our government subsidized platforms were showing the world our mess. The day after the inauguration, they had the Women's March in Washington, D.C. The crowd was estimated to be about 500,000 people. It was a million people. It was a bigger crowd than anybody, including the organizers, suspected. And when I saw the crowds, I was like, okay, it's on. To some of those protesters, the one that, ones that showed up with the masks and the shields, uh, may do this in other locations. They may be what you call professional protesters. They've marched. They've bled. Yes, some of them have died. This is hard. Every good thing is. FBI Director Comey has been fired. If you look at how the headlines flew back and forth, you'll see why so many viewers felt conflicted. With former intelligence officials on stand for questionable actions, trust in the country hit a low point, and I'm pretty sure that had everything to do with the unnecessary violence that played out. Someone whispered to them about a memo that may or may not exist in somebody's file at the FBI. This is truly deep state, uh, and you have collusion. I mean, this, this passes for reporting? At this point in our research, there were so many stories about intelligence officials rubbing shoulders with the press, we started to feel like we stepped into a movie theater. What is the nature of what you saw? I saw interaction and aware of interaction that, again, raised questions in my mind about what was the true nature of it. But I don't know. I, have, I don't have sufficient information to make a determination whether or not such cooperation or complicity or collusion was taking place. Because it didn't dawn on me originally that there might be corroboration for our conversation, there might be a tape. And my judgment was I needed to get that out into the public square. And so I asked a friend of mine to share the content of the memo with a reporter. What does it look like when a country reaches a breaking point? People seek validation from biased points of view. And then, driven by emotion, they cross all lines. It seems like the bits of information that the press gets from the intelligence community are just enough to be spun. And a manipulated story could turn a simple conflict into something violent. We found a lot of talk about why Charlottesville happened. On the surface, racism was the cause of the tragedy. But was there more? Are you with the all right? Get you with the all right? Get from me, my boy. Very inclusive. I'm looking to learn about inclusion, guys. I'm just looking to learn about inclusion and diversity. I'm here to learn about multiculturalism, and I'm here to learn about how how diverse groups lead to very high trust societies. 
I did a periscope before the guy crashed the car into the people, saying that what I see here is an agitation situation like we saw in Ukraine in 2013 and 2014. Why would Lee bring up Ukraine in this interview? It may seem off topic, but there were people blaming America for the Ukrainian uprising. Svodoba, S-V-O-B-O-D-A, Svodoba. That is a right-wing neo-Nazi party in Ukraine. Western historians also say that his followers carried out massacres of Polish and Jewish civilians. Let's tie all this into another story I've been reporting on for months, which is the Ukraine DNC interference in the election. I've talked with David Knight about this a number of times. The short version is there's a, a Democratic operative named Alexandra Chalupa, there's actually three Chalupa sisters, Alexandra, Andrea, and Irina. And uh, they're all ethnic Ukrainians and they all hate Russia. And when I, it's not me saying Aunt Alexandra Chalupa was key. Michael Isakoff, the uh, well-known investigative reporter, in a piece in Yahoo prior to the election, named, you know, here's the most influential people in the 2016 election. And he mentions Alexandra Chalupa is one of the most important people. Her sister, Andrea Chalupa, is also a Democrat operative. Her sister, Irina Chalupa, works for a Soros-funded organization. Alexandra Chalupa had met with the Ukrainian government. That's on the record. Uh, the Ukrainian government had then released information about Paul Manafort. Here comes some pretty devastating information. The Ukrainian government comes out and says Paul Manafort's name has been found in these secret ledgers and he got cash payments. Within a week, Paul Manafort's out of the campaign. This story breaks New York Times, Washington Post, hit after hit. Within a week, he's gone. What they didn't report was that on June 27th of 2017, after the election, the same prosecutor who said that Manafort's name was in this secret ledger for getting cash payment, on June 27, 2017, that same prosecutor comes out and says, oh, no, Manafort's name was, he, he, he did not get cash payments. We don't have any record of that. Picture for a second, if Donald Trump spoke to a group of people, and it included former SS officers. Why was McCain on stage with Chris Murphy and alleged extremists in Ukraine during the revolution? And what are tech camps? Does any of this relate to the violence we see in America? Many Twitter users were quick to remind him that he was pictured with Ukrainian nationalists not so long ago. Here, for example, he is posing with the leader of the far rights of Aboda or Freedom Party in Ukraine. This is about the future you deserve. People can look up uh, Hillary Clinton's Civil Society 2.0. What we've done with Secretary Clinton's Civil Society 2.0 program is we've taken one of America's undeniable strengths, the strength of our technology and of our, of our innovators, and we've put them to work in service of our diplomatic goals. So what we've done is we've created these things called tech camps. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting because it's exactly what they're accusing the Russians of doing. Alexandra Chalupa and her sister Andrea Chalupa had helped lead a campaign called Digital Madan which was tweet storms and stuff like that, and against the Russians and against the firm that Paul Manafort, who was Donald Trump's campaign manager, had lobbied for. So this goes back to 2013 and 2014. The guy who happened to catch that shot is with the US State Department. But let me point out something else. If you go to Brennan Gilmore's page, his Twitter page, you'll see he's got a picture of the young woman who was murdered. And do you know what it says? Martyr. Wow. Literally, it's, literally it says martyr. Now again, I don't like to jump to conclusions. I like to say, 
I'd like to ask some questions about who this kid was, where he came from, what do we know, get it all out in the open. Ukraine will make Europe better, and Europe will make Ukraine better. Kane yeah. said that the alt-right is behind these attacks, and he linked that same group to those who perpetrated the attack in Charlottesville. Well, so I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I'm sure Senator McCain must know what he's talking about. Uh, but when you say the alt-right, uh, define alt-right to me. You define it. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying, as no, Senator, define it for me. Come on, let's go. Define Senator it for McCain me. defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt-left that came right. charging him? Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? My name is oh. suck. <laughs> you. What, let me ask you this. What about the fact they came charging, that they came charging with clubs in their hands, swinging clubs? Do they have any problem? I think they do. Ah! We're talking recording. I'm filming it. I don't like being filmed. Can leave. There's a lot that's come out that we can now point to and, and see what the what the focus is going to be on. And the focus is going to be on what they call full-spectrum warfare, and that includes information warfare, which is now more important than ever. It's important to them, and it's important to us. Whistleblowers go to significant efforts to get us material, and often very significant risks. As a 27-year-old uh, works for the DNC, who was shot in the back, murdered uh, just two weeks ago uh, for un unknown reasons as he was walking down the street in Washington. So that was, that was just a robbery, I believe, wasn't it? No, it's, there's no finding. There is a period of time where two theories continuously popped up in our research. One was that Trump's campaign led Russia to hack the DNC and spread fake news to compromise Hillary's campaign. And the other was that Seth Rich leaked the data to WikiLeaks from inside the DNC. And the news about Hillary was just news about Hillary. Myself directly, I haven't even seen the computer that Seth Rich used. Here's the problem with all of this. I don't even know where the computer is. I checked with the police department. They said they don't know where the computer is and the FBI. And the person, listen to this, the person that called the father after I called the police to get information, that's the person that Seth was having problems with. The other day, Wheeler decided to expose who that person was. When I first reached out to the police department, Donna Brazil was the one that contacted the Rich family wanting to know why I was snooping around. Why would Donna Brazil even be involved in this situation if this is just a street murder? This is a progressive issue. Bernie Sanders voters around the country, millions and millions of people want to find out what happened with Seth Rich. So if this turns out to be true, that Seth Rich hey, was indeed the leaker, was indeed the leaker, it literally blew it blows apart. It blows apart the entire fake news of the Russiagate uh, narrative. The FBI requested the DNC's yep. computer servers numerous times. Mm -hmm. The DNC refused each and every request. I have a petition that's over 6,000 signatures to get the DNC to give its computer service to the FBI. So you want to talk about a, a conspiracy theory? When news becomes full of opinions and all we see or hear is one story combating another, it's important to reflect on the possible powers in play. Do all news outlets keep their agenda on the surface? Or are they just at the end of a string? While looking for a unique perspective, we found Seymour Hirsch. I have what they call in my business, long-form journalism. I have a narrative of how that whole fucking thing began. It's a Brennan operation. It was an American disinformation. And fucking the fucking president, at one point when they, they even started telling the press, they were back briefing the press. The head of the NSA was going and telling the press, this fucking cocksucker Rogers, was telling the press uh, that we even know who in the GRU, the Russian the Russian military intelligence service, leaked it. I mean, all bullshit. They were telling these two. I worked at the New York Times for fucking years. And the of the fucking New York Times that they have smart guys, but they're totally beholden on sources. These guys run the fucking Times. And Trump's not wrong. But, I mean, I, I wish he would calm down and had a better press secretary. They don't they have to be so. Trump's not wrong to think they all fucking lied about him. Uh, he was one of two staff people. I love him. I miss him. He was a patriot. And I hope to God we find out who murdered Seth Rich. You, you wrote in the book you feel responsible for his death. I, because he was my child. Okay. I understand. Don't, and, don't and make me cry. I'm sorry. I, didn't mean, I don't mean to do my that. My child. L let me just say, y'all. It was July 10th. Yeah. He was my child. They have been rejected. 
these elites squandered their power, they're arrogant, now they're fallen, now they're failed, and so they want to declare the American independent opposition to globalism as some foreign Russian fable because they themselves are the multinational foreign power, the neo-colonialist coming in and dominating and controlling we the people. And it's as phony as a $3 bill. And that's why even they've had Senate intelligence committees come out and say, we've got nothing. We've run into a brick wall because it's just that total and complete theater. Oh, my God. Oh, breaking news. ABC News' Brian Ross is reporting Michael Flynn promised full cooperation to the Mueller team and is prepared to testify that as a candidate, Donald Trump directed him to make contact with the Russians. Yes! So several hours later, a spokesperson for the network told CNN that, don't worry, Ross is going to be issuing a clarification. He said the president had asked Flynn to contact Russia during the campaign. He's now clarifying that, saying, according to Flynn, candidate Trump asked him during the campaign to find ways to repair relations with Russia and other hotspots. It's hard to imagine we're in a war because we associate war with people dying. But it's our values that are at risk in an information war. Here's what Lou Dobbs had to say last night. Good evening, everybody. It may be time to declare war outright against the deep state and clear out the rot in the upper levels of the FBI and the Justice Department. The encouraging thing is there's people pooling information and verifying sources to get you the truth. Don't be afraid of rabbit holes. Just understand when you've gone too far down, you got to turn around. So we have Mr. Mueller, who's investigating supposed coordination between the Trump campaign and Russians to influence the election. But we know for a fact the Clinton campaign paid Russians to do what? Influence the 2016 presidential election. We know that happened. Now what we're trying to figure out is, did the FBI help him? But Peter Strzok, the guy who ran the Clinton investigation, interviewed Mills Abedin, interviewed Secretary Clinton, changed gross negligence a crime to the term extreme carelessness, who ran the Russian investigation, who interviewed Mike Flynn, gets put on Mueller's team, and then he gets kicked off for a text message that's anti-Trump. If he kicked everybody off Mueller's team who was anti-Trump, I don't think there'd be anybody left. So here, here, there's gotta be something more here. It can't just be some text messages that show a pro-Clinton, anti-Trump bias. There's gotta be something more. And I'm trying to figure out what it is. But my hunch is it has something to do with the dossier. The last people I wanna set up a war, a literal war with, is Department of Justice and the intelligence community. And this is a declaration of yeah. war. You better think again, Mr. President. You've been around for 13 months. We've been around since 1908. I know how this game is going to be played. We're going to win. This president has demonstrated his willingness to do what he can to try to uh, undermine this investigation. You have a president that was supported by a foreign nation. Moore attended an anti-Trump protest that was organized by the Russian nationals who were just indicted for meddling in our election. The Robert Mueller investigation had a lot of moving parts, and it promised bombshells every day. Sensational stories filled with intrigue had us questioning everything. But stories lost steam, and journalists backtracked, while others refused to accept any theory connecting Trump's campaign to Russia. Even when Mueller's report was made public, people couldn't let it go, convinced there was evidence of collusion somewhere. There's a clear divide in our country, and it looks like this issue is far from over. We have to comb through all the garbage, the speculation, and bias with caution. Roger Stone believes the FBI attempted to entrap members of President Trump's 2016 election campaign through an arranged meeting. Court documents show Greenberg said he'd worked as an informant to the FBI. Are astounding that we would allow this type of investigation go uh, to uh, be embarked upon without any real solid foundation of collusion. Uh, but they were just stating the bottom line conclusions and there's nothing to uh, uh, suggest to me that those, you know, that those weren't... No collusion, no obstruction, no it's over, it's done, it's over. Well, the letter, the letter speaks for itself. I thought it did too. Where do we go from here? How long will reporters push their narrative before they give up and stick to the facts? There is no one who has a partisan mindset in this country who now thinks as highly as the DOJ or the FBI or the presidency as they once did. And that's important. It's important because 
we've had this belief, this, uh, this uh, myth that all is well, that our institutions are in the hands of grown-ups, and that the American citizenry is capable of overseeing this, this vastly unprecedented apparatus of power. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. The United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. I have an optimistic view of the future of journalism, but I guess that's uh, just because I have a hand in it. <laughs> the future of what? Uh, undercover, gonzo style journalism, I think that's where we're going. Citizen journalists are going to have to start uh, taking the lead on creating new ways that we do this. We're still, we're still doing journalism in ways very similar to how we did it 100 years ago. I'm optimistic. You know, I started out going more on Breitbart, Washington Times, Fox News, etc. I have been spending in the last 12 months an inordinate amount of time on progressive radio, left-leaning sites, and right-leaning sites. Pro-immigrant, right, like myself, pro-black. Um, that is uh, not even liberal, but you know, more to the left of that, then you're gonna consume news that is gonna be catered to you. And you're not gonna see what you know, right-wing folks are reading on Breitbart. Technology is mostly responsible for that, I think. It is possible today to wake up in the morning and all day long and all night long hear nothing that you don't agree with. We have to start getting better uh, as a society about learning how to take in information that we don't necessarily like or agree with and be able to hold space for a differing perspective. So when something comes in and, and we're able to hold that space in our brains, that's where we actually start to evolve and up level um, and come up with creative solutions, right? This polarization that's happening around, you know, I agree with that, that's what I feel and think, there's no room for anything else, is what's causing real damage now in society um, because it's me against you, him against her. The future of journalism is you. The technology has gotten to the point that, you know, that, that anyone can be a journalist, really. You go out and buy your iPhone, you can start tweeting on social media, you can start spreading your opinion, you can start documenting things you see and being a journalist. I mean, journalism has has vastly, vastly changed. I think the future of journalism, I think the future of the First Amendment and press freedom in this country, uh, it will be based on the outcome of the struggle between those who want a vibrant, robust, free internet with uh, true internet neutrality, and those who would censor and limit the reach and the dissenting voices of those who disagree with the government and the deep state. This is the single most important struggle of our time. Well, do you think the media is going to come around? Do you think the media is going to eventually be on your side? And he's on stage with Reince Priebus. And Reince Priebus basically says, you know, yeah, I think they will. I think the media is going to come around. And Bannon says, well, one of the reasons Reince and I get along is because we don't agree on everything. And we can, we can argue and still be friends. But no way, no way. The media is the enemy and they will never come around. And Steve Bannon had that exactly right. We still have a journalist going to two or three sources who may or may not be bullshitting them and may or may not know what they're talking about and may or may not contradict each other, thus making the reader no wiser. And then he goes to an editor who knows less than the journalist knows about it and a fact checker who, in my experience, having been covered quite a bit uh, in the last four or five years and having previously worked as a journalist myself, uh, are not supermen. We always talk about Russia and how they kill journalists, how Putin kills journalists. And I don't, I'm not going to sit here and dispute that that's happened. Um, or that Boris Yeltsin, our guy in Moscow, killed journalists as well. Uh, it may have happened. But we have a different way of killing journalists. And it's not through eliminating them with bullets. It's by destroying their reputations. People have gotten lazy. Instead of thinking for ourselves, we find supposed thought leaders who can be as dumb as celebrities to as supposedly smart as academic experts. And we listen, we let them think about the problems, they reach a conclusion, and then we just accept their answers. Instead, what we should be doing is really thinking for ourselves. And I think that's what Donald Trump and his team 
are trying to get people to do. And by creating all this controversy, I believe actually more and more people are thinking for themselves. What's important is that people out there, young people, are fascinated by the truth. And you're the future. You're it. And what you're going to do is you're going to, going to pass it on to somebody else. And this is going to be the new rock music. This is going to be it, the truth. Your version, whatever it is, I don't care what it is, journalism. You know, journalism sounds, no, it's nonsense. What it is, it's you basically using what's going on, current events, whatever you want to call it, that sounds so boring, but what's happening, and you're making it now as an entertainment medium. And it's that huge mass of people that are now reporting and now documenting what's happening that is overturning the global estate and the mainstream corporate media uh, because they've got all these packaged lies and all this manipulated garbage and these talking points and we're just coming with the truth which is we don't know what's going on. We're trying to find out and we're honestly reporting. And it's that open-eyed wonderment of the world and not having an agenda that is going to turn this planet around and I think save humanity. I certainly hope so, I've got four children. For now, we have an open and free internet to help us uncover lies and truths. But based on some recent censorship, it seems like someone or something is trying to pull the veil back over our eyes. To me, the news is supposed to be educational. Reporters should only give us the facts about current events so we can develop our own opinions and take action if a problem needs our attention. The second a news outlet tries to come up with a theory or speculate anything beyond facts, they become sensational. They become entertainment. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when viewers accept opinion as fact. Living in a time where one post on social media can change the world, we all have to be more mindful about what we're saying. And we can't censor people. It's not the answer. If that power exists, there's no control in who gets to censor who. We would lose all progress. The First Amendment exists for a reason. It prevents tyranny. We need to let people speak, no matter what they have to say, so we can understand each other and find a common ground. Remember, it's important to investigate and understand everything before we have an emotional reaction or form an opinion. Sensationalized truth can be worse than a lie. Try to understand every news outlet's real agenda and make sure their sources aren't trying to manipulate them. The more sources, the more investigating, the better. Just keep your guard up. There's a lot of people out there that want to influence the way you think. Like that, Randy? The size queen stuff? Yeah.